Good morning. You guys hear me okay? Yeah, not too shouty, not too quiet. Lovely. Right. Um, my name's Jules Taplin. I'm Technical Director of Plan B Disaster Recovery. Um, I've got a couple of things to do with you today. Um, the first is um, a bit of a presentation. I'm going to bore you with slides about best practice for disaster recovery. Um, secondly, and it was promoted as, we were trying to do a bit of a DR recovery race. Can you recover a business's systems in the same amount of time it takes to shine a number of shoes? Sounded like a crackingly good plan in a meeting room a few weeks ago. Logistically, it's pretty darn impossible. Um, so if you're in here hoping for your shoes signed, I'm sorry, we can do it for your outside. <laughs> if you'd like to come by the stand, that's there. Um, but failing that, we are going to do a business recovery anyway. It's going to be a little unvisual, and you'll have to get a degree of stuff on faith. But um, if we'd like to go for a scenario, I have my not-so-beautiful assistant, Tim, in the corner there. Um, for the purposes of today's disaster, he's a small business of some description with a bit of an IT problem. Um, we have his systems protected by the Plan B service. We actually asked for, about five minutes ago, those systems to be put into recovery. I've hit the button. That's the only thing I'm going to do. Um, and at some point during this presentation, his system should become ready. He should be able to at least send email and prove to you to some level it's working. Um, it's not the most visual thing in the world. If you'd like to see more, come and talk to us after the fact. We're in a stand over the corner there. Um, and hopefully that will um, you know, get you something that's a little more interesting. I have to say, it's fundamentally the least visual process known to mankind. And I still don't quite know how you could make it more visual. Yeah, it's machines booting, but they do work. <laughs> that's the kind of the point. Um, so, that will, that will crack on at some point during the presentation, I'm sure. Um, in the meantime, I'd like to talk to you about you know, the edges of disaster recovery, best practice, what we've learned from the time we've spent operating the business and um, how we think businesses should best proceed about these bits and pieces. Um, so pretty unsurprising pile of questions. Um, you know, do you need it? Why? How? <laughs> what should you do with it? How do you stand a decent chance of getting some good value out of it? and it actually doing something that you need at the time you need it, because there's nothing in the world more useful than a DR strategy that doesn't save your business. Um, and chances are you're only gonna know about it when it's all too late. Um, so, um, <clears throat> here's this traditional towering inferno, you know, why you should, why you should give a monkeys. Um, we actually do have a towering inferno. That's one of our customers um, and around April of last year. Um, and that's a, you know, pretty good sign that you're going to need some pretty big help pretty soon. Um, so we'll, we might talk a little bit more about them, but um, yeah, this stuff does genuinely happen. It does genuinely happen to businesses. And even if your building doesn't spontaneously combust, there's plenty of other things that can go wrong that means people have need of us. Um, so, so some of these stats undoubtedly you've seen before. There's a lot of them are being kicked around. Um, but these events tend to be business ending if they're not handled well. They're not inconvenient, they're not mildly troublesome, they're not a few people had to work dead hard for a few days, they are potentially you never get back on your feet from them. Um, so, you know, there, there's the scenario, um, you know, 80% die within 18 months of it, 90% don't make it past two years. Um, some of these big scenarios as well disrupt people well beyond just their straightforward close by intention. So some of the big infrastructure attacks have had some fairly serious big issues. Sep September 11 is normally hackneyed, but equally there was a big BT fire a few years ago um, that managed to destroy comms for a good quarter of the south of England and took the best part of a day or so to handle it. So e even if you are not directly the recipient of the incident, loss of comms, loss of capability to provide activity can happen to you even when there's no failure of your own as part of the, the piece itself. Um, th there are lots of these stats about um, loss of productivity, loss of activity due to outage, IT disaster or similar. Um, they're quite easy to work with the stats, but, but you know, it's very easy to see for any medium-sized business. If you have no present systems, you, you lose a lot of productivity very, very fast. Um, and again, you know, so more of the bits and pieces there. Um, some of those stats are pretty high, some of them are pretty real. Even if you only believed half of it, there's still plenty of a case in there for why, you know, for why you should consider it as something that's important. Um, in terms of what you're trying to mitigate, um, you know, we're talking about 
loss of data, loss of credibility, loss of reputation, loss of sales, loss of everything. Um, th the real trick with this, um, you, know, you can argue about financial cost and what it's cost you in terms of direct losses to your business on your outage or your disaster, but fundamentally by far the biggest cost is going to be the uncalculatable one that's about how would my life have been better if I hadn't spent all that time with this incident? You know, which, is, which are the deals I'm not going to land because I was down for this? Which are the customers who have thought we were fabulous for years and now really don't think that highly of us because we had this problem and two weeks later we're still not delivering them something that looks like service? Um, and, and it's those reputational damage incidents that, that are the ones that, once you're in the disaster, are the ones that really tend to give the senior execs the you know, the sleepless nights, because they're the ones they can't really calculate. It's pretty difficult to mitigate against them in terms of business interruption insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and fundamentally, after the fact, when you have to stand up in front of a bunch of people and go, we're still here, but we had this problem, it's very easy for everyone to say, well, why didn't you have a better provision at that point? And, and there's no good answer to it, because clearly the point's been made for you against you before you even started. Um, so... And the last point about that is, you know, if you do have a well-practiced DR plan, if you do know what you're doing, you're going to cope with these things much, much, much better than you did and if you didn't have the piece. Even if you take the simple pieces about what people are going to go and where they're going to work and how they're going to deal with it, the second time round you run any of these things, they work a great, great deal better. Um, so, leads us on to... What are we going to do? You know, assume you've decided that there is a requirement to do something worthwhile. Um, you know, you need to get a plan together. You need a strategy for it. So, this is pretty straightforward stuff. But effectively, you need to understand what it is you're trying to achieve. And if we narrow that for a little minute um, down to the IT aspects of of disaster recovery. Um, you have a bunch of systems, they have a bunch of your data, they're your ability to, to trade and carry on with whatever it is you're doing. You need to understand what those systems are, what their importance is to your business, what the importance of the data on it to your business is. Um, and you get to the straightforward two great acronyms that Disaster Recovery runs on. That's RTO, the Recovery Time Objective, and RPO, the Recovery Point Objective. So the two of those give you how long are you prepared to be non-functional before you have your systems back, and that's your recovery time, and how current must your data be for that to be considered useful to the business, and that's your recovery point. Now, not all data is the same. Some of it may be highly current, some of it may be largely historical. That will give them a different recovery point. Some of it's less important, some of it's more important. That might give you the recovery time. Once you've done that, you then need to start getting a plan, getting together that deals with all of the parts of your business you need to sort out. So, technology. So, you know, pretty much guaranteed given this audience here that these are businesses with strong reliance on IT systems, otherwise I'm not quite sure what you're up to here. Um, but um, you know, we'll talk about technology and how we deal with those a little bit later. Um, suppliers are a big part of how you get this plan together. So you need to think about, firstly, suppliers for providing DR services if that's what you want to do. Um, and secondly, the impact of disasters on your suppliers. Um, and typically what we're talking about in these scenarios are, firstly, who is providing your DR? Um, and if we had one suggestion we could make about who should provide your DR, under almost no sensible circumstances should it be the people who provide your normal IT. Um, and the reason we say that, firstly, we would, wouldn't we? Um, but possibly more importantly, if it's a managed service provider and they have a large-scale outage, you are one person among very, very, very many and it's great if you're their biggest customer and the one they can't possibly disappoint. It's very, very not good <laughs> if you're the little one who's nearly out of contract and you're a bit of the pain in the ass and you're not worth that much money anyway, in which case you're a long way down the pile. <laughs> um, and equally, even if it's your IT service provider, your in-house IT staff, etc., for any given disaster, there's going to be some better things they can be doing than trying to muck around with your IT systems. Whether it's trying to get people sorted out, whether it's trying to get comms in your new building sorted out, they will have a job that they should be able to do in a disaster. They could be doing that better than trying to bring back your core systems. And equally, you've just asked someone who's had a disaster to bring back your core IT systems. They probably haven't got most of the tools they're used to. You know, their desktops aren't there, they're not where they used to be. You know, they're not necessarily in a good way. So that, that's just 
not very well thought out. Um, so, yeah, that's what we'll say about that. Um, in terms of process, you have business processes that need to work, so you need to think about those in terms of what do they need, both in terms of IT systems, in terms of locations, in terms of tedious things like printers, access to equipment, access to whatever it is they need to do to do their job. Um, but equally, if you're going to get through these incidents, you need processes. You're going to need systems that allow you to know what it is you're going to do when this happens. What do you do when you've got no comms? What do you do if you've got no power? What do you do if your building is fine, it's just the ground floor is under a foot of water? Um, incidentally, when we're talking about disasters and, and water and floods, um, don't think Thames, think Thames water. In the last several years, we've found, seen far more people flooded, not because of rivers rising and bursting their banks, but water mains filling up in the street outside and deciding the quickest way out is through their building. Um, and between that and plumbing failures, those are a far more credible failure than the one that, you know, the environment agent will, agency will cheerfully tell you is a one in 200 year risk. It tells you nothing about the toilet on top of your server room or what its plumbing's like. Um, so, um, finally, people, you know, critical staff, who do you need in a scenario where you have a proper disaster, who do you most need, where do you, where do you want them to be, how can you get them there? All of these things are things that are difficult to think about on the hoof, but are quite easy to think about before the fact when you can sit down and think about it calmly. Um, and then, you know, data and security. So your data is going to be obviously crucial to it. The security of your data is going to matter. You may have additional security requirements due to how do you handle your business when you're degraded or remote or similar. Um, and the only other thing I would say when you're talking about, proper, um, about strategy, it helps if you can resist the temptation to only plan for the best case scenario. It's, it's very easy to go, guys, it's fine, and it'll be cheaper if the problem isn't very hard. So let's plan on the assumption that all our good IT staff are in, that none of them are on holiday, that none of them are sick. Let's plan on the basis that we've recently done the plan and our staff know about it. Let's plan on the basis that the nearest workplace location service is available and everyone knows where it is. Um, in our experience, disasters happen not at the best time for a business. In fact, if you had to pick a time, it's at the worst time for a business. It's at their busiest time. It's at their most peak holiday time. Blimey, I think we've got a cab. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's worth noting that, that even though it's easier to plan if you assume everything's going to be in place, it's a much more effective plan if you assume you may not have all the convenient things you have. We, we, we've seen recovery stymied by two or three hours because the building that failed was the one that had the extranet on with the phone list for all the other offices. And literally at three in the morning, no one could find the other offices because the phone system was down in the building, as was the phone list, as was the emergency plan. And it's very, very simple for simple things to, to ruin your life. So it's worth putting the extra effort in to plan against what, what you think might, might go wrong there. Um, so if we move on just a little way, um, I want to talk about um, recovery time and getting your systems back. This is a little closer to what we're about than the straight level DR bits pieces. Um, I'm pretty sure I've produced a slide there that no one can actually read. Um, so <laughs> we'll, we'll try and go for the, the approach. Um, the the left-hand slide there is talking about a traditional approach to rebuilding machines against, um, you know, find equipment, sort it out. I mean, you know, and, and briefly speaking, you could, you could probably summarize it as get equipment, start recovering from tape, sacrifice a chicken, cross your fingers, hope like hell, load it, sort the operating system out, hope you can remember what your IP addressing scheme was, yeah, and carry on through a whole bunch of steps until you get there. Um, plan B for what it's worth, don't really believe in that. We believe in what we call pre-recovery. Um, you know, Tim there listened to refer to it as the Blue Peter method of, you know, here's one we prepared earlier. Um, and, and effectively the approach is make sure that every time you have a backup taken, it is rebuilt into a rescue image. That rescue image is tested, certified, and guaranteed to work so that when you do need it, it's a very, very non-trivial thing. Um, you know, it's very non-trustful, it's very easy to do, it's trivial. Um, and at that point, you can crack on with the things that are more important than your disaster, which is, where's everyone gonna go? How do I communicate with my staff? How do I communicate with my stakeholders? How do I communicate with my customers who are now a little bit upset because they've seen the building on the news? Um, so, 
Um, the key then is to think about data, data loss, how you deal with it, how you minimize it, how you know what it is you've got. Um, if you're backing up data and it's only held on site, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise to anyone by the, for this day and age, but that's not going to do you in a bunch of, of difficult scenarios. We've had customers where um, our, our towering inferno guy at the start weren't allowed back into their business their building for 48 hours even to work out what they still had that was unburnt. Because until the fire brigade have been through, looked at it, checked it safe, made anything that isn't soggy kind of damp now, they're not actually going to, to let you in to deal with it. And it's pretty tough to know how you can plan a recovery when you don't even know what bits you've still got. Um, so anything on site, you pretty much have to regard is, is, is out of scope for the duration of your time. Um, the other thing to bear in mind, and one of the big problems people have with this stuff is, most businesses are pretty good, or try to be pretty good at running backups, and they're pretty expert in doing that and checking it's there and working on it. They tend to be rubbish at doing restores, because restores are the things you do in 0.001% of circumstances, and you might use it to get back a bit of data, but you're unlikely to restore complete environments and complete systems. So you should be selecting a mechanism for doing this where you are pretty sure the restore process is as easy as the backup process, and, and that's the key piece. Um, Microsoft, when they're busy hawking uh, DPM, have a statistic which even surprised me. 40% um, of recoveries from tape backups fail. Now, you know, I'm no stranger to, to tape and, and just how desperately it can let you down, but that seems a lot. 20% maybe. I mean, yeah, realistically, though, that's not a failure rate you can, you can accommodate in the scope of any kind of plan, even if it's a fraction of that. Um, so. Recovery is as important as backup. In fact, if anything, it's, it's more important. Um, so you should treat it as a decent recovery. And you do need to know what you have. It's too late in a disaster to go, so where was my last good backup? How do I know this one's right? How am I going to spend a good few hours recovering from this only to discover this one isn't any good anyway? I'll have to go back to an older one. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, this is where we get back to the stuff that we're a little bit cleverer at. Um, we provide guarantees around recovery. We can guarantee you that... If you call us and you have an issue, we guarantee that your last night's backup, your last good backup will be available for you in the time we say, and it will work. And there are penalties for us if we don't do that right. So it's available, you can get it. Question then is, how do you do that without testing? Well, you can't. <laughs> um, but if you're trying to come up with a service that doesn't guarantee it's gonna work, you have to ask the question, well, well yeah, you only need it once, hopefully. <laughs> What's the point of it if you can't guarantee it's gonna work? Um, and then, you know, recovery point, um, you know, pretty much 24 hours should be achievable nowadays. For specific bits, you could probably do better. Um, there's some difficulties to do with very current and very guaranteed, but certainly a day should be achievable. Um, so, this one is really about why is it that everybody hasn't got decent provision? Um, and the honest answer is a lot of the options just cost too much. Yeah, in an ideal world, I think everyone would be happier if they had off-site a complete mirror of everything working perfectly that they've always got and they're always happy with. And the reason that I'm not talking to a room full of people who all do is because nobody wants to pay that much money to get that for most of their systems most of the time. Um, so the key to that is what you can do, what can you do to reduce the costs and make that a little more, a little more reasonable. Um, <clears throat> similarly, we do this pre-recovery, recovery in advance. If you were to try and recover every backup you ever took and checked it worked, you'd have people who did nothing more than that for their entire life. No one's going to do that. It doesn't exist as a manual process in, in the world at all. Um, similarly, testing is time consuming. It's hard enough to get a business to run a decent DR exercise once a year, let alone spend time on the pure mechanics of recovering systems and checking they're working all right. Um, so. You know, again, it tends to be done poorly, if at all. It's the lowest priority job in the world. Check my backups are okay and do some test restores. Um, and the only other thing is that basically, you, you, know, you can try and skimp on this stuff and it will spend less money in the meantime if you don't do it. But even a smallish incident is gonna cost you far more than the time and effort you save not doing this stuff properly in the first place. Um, the key to making this stuff work is automating it. It has to work, it has to work automatically, it has to be something that happens day in, day out, regardless, without anyone putting any time and energy into it. Um, so, 
testing. There's a couple of bits and pieces that are worth talking about testing. Um, so, typically the way you'll customers do disaster recovery exercises. They tend to do tabletop exercises where they sit in a, t in a room and think about what might happen and what they would do and try and bring some people in and go, so what would you do now and, and do it as a piece of role play. Um, it's great. It's better than no testing at all. It does tend to confirm the incorrect assumptions you made when you made your test in the first place. So it, it, it tends very strongly to confirm what you thought was going to happen in the first place, and it's no substitute for an actual exercise where you actually start doing bits and pieces. Um, so it's worth thinking about it. Uh, you also need to make sure that you're not simply running an ITDR test in isolation. Um, that's fine, but you'll tend to define your requirements as, a, as an IT success based on your understanding of what you needed. It doesn't cope with the rest of your business and their expectations. So it's easy to prove the IT bit works, but without proving that your staff could access it properly or that they could get to it from that location or get to it from home as easily as they might or that any of your staff actually knew what they were doing with it in the first place. Um, generally speaking, um, you should be trying to run a DR exercise every six months or so, um, even if one's a tabletop and then one's a, a full job. Um, and the only other thing we'd say is it's a darn sight easier if you're pretty sure your IT systems are going to work. <laughs> because then you can actually schedule a test where most of your time is spent testing the DR plan, not testing the, the prerequisites for it, which is, and now get me my IT systems back. Um, finally, um, the key to all of these systems is they are iterative, and your best bet is to make sure that every time you run an exercise, you make sure you learn the lessons from it. So you need to review your test, how it worked, against the requirements that you thought you had in the first place. Um, the key to that, um, you know, pretty, pretty much is, go back to my first requirements. Did I achieve what I said I set out to do? And then did the technology work? Did the suppliers work? Did we get them in in a way that was working? Did they do what they're supposed to? Are my business processes saved? And do we have a way of knowing that that business process was saved and checked and sorted out? Um, the other thing to bear in mind is the first time you do a proper one of these, it's almost guaranteed to be a horror show. Something will have gone wrong in the planning that meant that all your staff have evacuated the building and now have no idea how they're going to get home because all their car keys are in the building in the first place. Something, something as, as simple as that is going to almost knock the first one off the rails. So do one, review it, schedule another one shortly afterwards when you've got enough time to get over it and work out what went awfully wrong. Um, and other than that, you know, check your people, know what they're doing. They will be a much better the second time round. And if, you've, if you're lucky enough to have done a decent DR test shortly before your incident, the, just the fact your staff know what to expect will make a huge difference to how quickly you can perform and how well you can do these things. Um, and similarly, you know, did you hit the data, did you do it? The key to doing all this properly is you just have to be prepared. And that's the key. Um, so there we go. Um, Tim, how are we doing? It's up. Aha. Okay, so we have, here we are, back to my visual demo. I am told I have an email. If I can just get to my email. little whirling ball of I'm checking for email. <laughs> okay, fine. I will leave that there. Um, so the systems are there. If you'd like us to show you in a little more detail, come see us at the stand. Um, the, the key to all of this is just take a message from it. The key to successful recovery is planning. The key to successful IT recovery is knowing it's going to work. Um, we routinely recover systems for customers who are in a position where an hour or two after the incident, they can get a couple of hundred users into a location and working from our towering inferno scenarios. So it can be done, but you do have to work at it and plan at it. Um, I have a flashing red light, which I think means sod the hell off. So thank you very much for your time. Um, anyone got any questions if we have time for such? No? <laughs> okay, guys, thanks ever so much for your time.